Good morning, everyone. My name is Tasha Ardalan. I'm the program coordinator for the San Diego Region Irrigated Lands Group. And it's my pleasure to welcome Joel Kramer from the Resource Conservation District of Greater San Diego County. He'll be providing a wonderful presentation for us today that will satisfy your two hours of required annual education. If you have any questions, we will have a Q&A session at the end. And you're always welcome to throw up a question in our chat box. Joel, please take it away. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, thanks for hosting Tasha and the, the Farm Bureau. Um, my name is Joel Kramer. I'm an agricultural specialist at the Resource Conservation District of Greater San Diego County. A lot of you may be familiar with RCDs as we call them, Resource Conservation Districts. If you're not, I'll get into that a bit later. And today I'm here to talk about um, what we do through conservation to improve water quality and how we hope to help you in that process. Um, so firstly, a little background about me. Um, I've always been interested in water resources. Uh, I got my Bachelor of Science in Aquatic Science from the University of Washington in 2010, and I finished a master's in watershed science at San Diego State in 2018. Um, and during my career, I've worked in various water quality monitoring uh, roles, firstly in more of an ecology, ecological role through the Carlsbad Watershed Network while I was at the San Alejo Lagoon Conservancy, uh, where we had stream gauges in six different watersheds of North County. Um, monitoring nutrient levels, dissolved oxygen, and anything else that might affect the lagoons downstream. And then more recently as a biologist at Western Solutions where we contracted for the county to do stormwater monitoring um, and monitor flows uh, and bacteria levels and nutrient levels coming off of uh, re primarily residential areas and different stormwater outfalls um, during storms. So here's a picture of me at San Diego State, working for Western Solutions in the middle of a storm. Um, definitely more of a nocturnal job than my current role as an agricultural specialist. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about my thesis as well, because uh, that's where I really got to take my interest in agriculture to the professional level for the first time. Um, and the, uh, yeah, so the topic of my study at San Diego State was how farmers adapted to water scarcity. Um, and I had a great case study available because in the Mexicali Valley, I believe in 2007, um, they experienced, or, or 2013, they experienced the magnitude 7.2 earthquake that knocked out um, canals in a whole region of the valley. And the results were so severe that we could see it from outer space uh, with satellite imagery. Um, and secondly, the valley was impacted by falling groundwater levels um, from overpumping over in combination with the lining of the All-American Canal. Um, and so we were able to use remote sensing uh, and vegetation indices, so basically looking at the greenness over the, over the season to see which farms had gone out of commission due to the, those water shortages and identify exactly which areas would be good to do interviews in. Uh, and we used that data to go out, I assembled a team of a few field researchers and we drove around the Mexicali Valley talking to farmers, some of whom had not been able to um, make it through the water scarcity, others who had moved their farms to other regions where water was available, and others who had found a way to adapt um, by acquiring water rights from others or pumping differently. Um, and uh, it was just very eye-opening. So here the image you'll see is um, some of those larger farms that were able to de drill deeper wells along the border and they had uh, large-scale export organic agriculture as opposed to the, some of the smaller farms who were not able to survive those conditions. Um, but agriculture has always been central for me. Um, I grew up in Solana Beach and uh, I grew up playing in abandoned avocado orchards and my first job was in habitat, habitat restoration where um, the land had previously been used for uh, dry land, lima bean agriculture. So I just, um, yeah, I think that the agricultural identity of North County still has a lot of strength and, 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 and potential. Um, so a little bit more about the organization where I work, the Resource Conservation District of Greater San Diego County. Um, in our agricultural department, um, we provide a variety of services uh, that I'll go into, but more broadly, um, some of the things that we do are uh, 
about fire safety is, is a major emphasis where we help residents uh, prepare for fire and create defensible space. We also manage Wild Willow Farm and uh, two community gardens in the South Bay of San Diego, um, which we use for community outreach and education about uh, agricultural or uh, regenerative agricultural practices through our apprenticeship and internship program. Um, we have a pollinator program uh, where we are breeding in partnership with local nurseries, breeding out local native, uh, local native milkweed uh, for commercial sale so that we're not bringing out other, other species from around the state for, for milkweed and monarch use. Um, and then in our agricultural program, um, we provide a variety of services ranging from carbon farm planning to um, direct assistance on applications, um, advice on implementing conservation practices like composting, cover cropping, or planting hedgerows, um, and uh, also monitoring and analysis of the, the effects of some of those practices. And I'll show you a little bit about our demonstration project in just a bit. And below you'll see some of the funders that support our work. Um, but in case you're not entirely familiar with what a resource conservation district is, um, we are one of three in the county. Um, Mission RCD, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, is that red um, area in, in the northwest of the county here, um, <clears throat> Fallbrook, Bonzel, Rainbow area. Um, and then Upper San Luis Rey contains Paula, Palma Valley, uh, Warner Springs, Palomar Mountain. Um, and ours is quite a bit larger. That's because um, in, I believe, the 90s, uh, the the director, board of directors at RCD felt that we'd be more effective if we teamed together um, with other RCDs. And so we, we um, patched together the greater San Diego County RCD. <clears throat> and we cover a, a, the largest area, but probably the lowest density of agricultural producers out of the RCDs. Um, originally, resource conservation districts were intended to um, address soil erosion issues stemming uh, from the Dust Bowl era. Uh, but since then, we've seen that there's so many more resource conservation issues that are relevant, and one, the one I'll be focusing on today is water. Um, and so there's uh, more than 90 RCDs around the state and hundreds of them around the country um, to serve local jurisdictions and be your point of contact um, to find the resources you need to conserve your resources on your farm. So these are some of the things that we offer. Um, we offer irrigation evaluations where we can come out to your uh, farm to see how efficient your system is and advise you on how to save water um, and get it to your crops more effectively. Um, we've also received a grant to provide rebates for pump efficiency tests if you are a small farm or come from an underserved community. Um, and I'll talk about why that's important later. Uh, we do soil sampling for organic carbon content um, to see how much organic matter you're um, you're building up in your soil through good conservation practices. We can give you advice on how to implement those conservation practices based on what local producers are doing or based on our contacts around the state. And that goes for ranches as well. We do a lot of support for ranches. Um, we've been trained in carbon farm planning from the Carbon Cycle Institute uh, so that you can uh, kind of create a wish list of what you'd like to do on your farm ideally over time um, to improve the soil conditions, the biodiversity there, the water conservation, um, and step-by-step step reach those goals while sequestering carbon and making your farm more adapted and resilient to harsh weather conditions. Um, we also have botanists on staff who can advise you about which plants would be best to install that would not need much water and uh, improve pollination from a native plant selection. Um, and lastly, um, this program you may be familiar with through the Fire Safe Council, which is our sister organization. Um, the Fire Safe Council provides free chipping for defensible space. So if you're a younger, more able-bodied person, then um, you are totally eligible for, for free chipping of the brush you've cleared. And if you're an older individual um, or low income, then we'll actually be happy to come out and clear it for you, depending on the area that you're in. So. I'll leave my contact details at the end of the con uh, presentation if you're interested in any of these services. Um, but now I'll jump into how we're connected to the Irrigated Lands Group because we're actually a member of the Irrigated Lands Group. Um, as I mentioned, we run a community garden and we've dedicated about, um, 
uh, let's see, two and a half acres of the community garden to uh, plots for beginning farmers. We call it our incubator farm. Um, it's located in the Tijuana River Valley and it's leased from county land, county parks, um, and it's in the, the flood zone. So that's why it's able to remain as agriculture. Um, but <clears throat> in the terms of use for those 10 farmers, we've required that they limit their pesticide use or pretty much eliminate it as well as um, use water-wise infrastructure. Um, and in doing so, we've been able to make an agreement with the county to uh, have a group application. So all 10 plots are able to report at once um, on the application. Um, and that just makes it a lot easier for us. And if you think that you and your neighbors might be in a similar scenario, it's perhaps worth exploring. Um, we have had some difficulties, difficulties though, as I'm sure many of you have experienced. Tasha was um, explaining to me that the, the reporting process can be cumbersome at times, and we've experienced that as well. Here you'll see a picture of a severe flooding event in 2019, because we're on the Tijuana River. Um, when the tide is high at the same time as a storm event, the, the farms flood. Um, and um, on the report, um, my colleague Andy Williamson, who submits the report, says inform me, uh, it doesn't really uh, account for that situation. So we, we've had to put into the comments that there's periodic flooding um, nearby, uh, regular flooding of the river itself and periodic flooding nearby, but that we are not actively flood, flood irrigating the area. Um, and so I think there's room for improvement in the reporting system for the water board to think from a more producer oriented perspective. Um, but yeah, I just wanna celebrate the fact that San Diego producers are leaders in conservation. Um, a USDA report came out recently in the last few months on Ag Alert that showed that um, we have one of the highest levels of investment in solar projects, as well as drip irrigation compared to other counties around the state. And California is a leader in that already. So San Diego really is a lead leader. Um, it's partly by um, interest, but a lot of it is by necessity. We have very high water costs as compared to other parts of the state. Um, and I think uh, because so much of our water supply is imported, uh, San Diegans are acutely aware of, uh, of that supply and, and its uh, fragility. Um, fortunately, there are local programs to incentivize conservation through the Water Authority and the County of San Diego. Um, and now there's growing to be more programs to incentivize conservation through the state, such as the SWEET program that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and so, yeah, I think that we can really be touted as a, a model for other counties, just like how we are with fire. Um, and that we've in producers have taken it on themselves to implement a lot of these practices, um, but uh, they're not necessarily being recognized for it at the state. And so I just wanna appreciate the work that the Irrigated Lands Group has done to show that um, to the state water board about how progressive we are locally and, and that the issues we face in terms of water quality may be different than those in the Central Valley or the coast. Um, so I'm gonna shift over to what are some of those best management practices that you would see uh, for water quality. And this is straight out of the County of San Diego's guidance documents. Um, this is heavily paraphrased, but um, one major goal is to manage the flows. You don't want to have a lot of storm water runoff coming off of your farm. Um, both for downstream purposes, but as a producer, you would want to take advantage of those flows, both your irrigation water and your stormwater runoff to infiltrate the soil and have it be available to your plants. Um, you don't want to chemically contaminate those waterways. And so the amount of nutrients that you apply, uh, hopefully not pesticides, but if applying pest pesticides, you'd want to reduce that so that it's what would be used by the plant or by the farm itself, and that there wouldn't be excess running off or sinking into the groundwater. Um, thirdly, so another form of contamination would be erosion. Uh, we can see in our arroyos and our brown streams following rain, just how much sand is, is, uh, is, and, and soil is getting taken off the top of the surface and going into our waterways um, when uh, it's most needed on the farm to create fertility. Um, and fourthly, you wouldn't want to ir over irrigate. Um, sorry, fourthly, you wouldn't want to over irrigate uh, because 
of course, irrigation water is costly, but um, from a water quality perspective, that water would also flow downstream and carry whatever nutrients um, are in the water with it. Um, there, there is the consideration that if you irrigate more heavily, you might dilute whatever contaminants are in the water, but there's other ways of dealing with that that I'll advocate for in a bit. But I want you to notice how these water quality best management practices um, closely align with these regenerative agriculture best management practices, which we follow in our work. So a lot of what we promote are conservation practices, much like NRCS defines, the Natural Resource Conservation Service defines, and Carbon Cycle Institute define um, to really rebuild the health of the soil so that it improves your productivity and yield um, and the resilience of your crop um, over time so that you need to use less and less inputs. Um, and it follows these five principles. Firstly, you wanna keep the soil covered. So if there's an opportunity to put mulch on the soil or to retain um, some vegetation on the top of the soil, especially during the rainy season um, for vegetation and especially during the, the warm season for mulch, that's, that's very important um, to kind of keep the a skin on the soil. Secondly, um, you wanna diversify your crops. If, if you happen to be focusing on one single variety, then you at least wanna make sure to have other crops around the edges because that'll improve the resilience of those, of those crops. Um, to disease and, and to environmental conditions, but ideally um, you have multiple crops that you're growing on site. Um, thirdly, uh, it's important to maintain the root systems. Um, so if you're vegetable cropping, ideally you're just cutting off um, harvesting at the surface and not pulling those roots. Um, and if you're maintaining weeds, it's actually preferable to remove the top of the vegetation but not actually take out the weeds entirely. And that's because it's gonna hold the soil in place and decompose in place to enrich the soil, um, as well as create uh, cavities in the soil for water to infiltrate and be retained. Um, fourthly, and this is something that hasn't been explored all that much in San Diego, but some producers we've spoken with, especially in orchards are uh, considering this and using this is integrating livestock. Livestock um, really, uh, have a lot of effects that improve the soil health um, if you kind of measure how intensely they're there. Um, but just having a pass through from goats or sheep um, in an orchard or, or a vineyard can really, really help um, to fertilize the soil, to do kind of mil minimal tilting of the top of the soil. Um, and, um, and so we really advocate for that. And there's some great examples from outside of the county as well as some in the mountain areas that I'd be glad to share. And lastly, um, minimizing tillage. So, um, of course, in an orchard, you most likely wouldn't be tilling your soil, but vegetable crops often still are tilled. And in regenerative agriculture, this is going to negate all of the progress you've made on building your soil organic matter and the life in the soil um, and the fertility of it, so that you will have to continue to add nutrients um, each time at a high degree. Um, and, but just bringing this all back to water quality, when you till the soil, that makes it very vulnerable to erosion. It makes it so that you have to add more nutrients when um, the nutrients in the soil should be able to supply at least part of what you need um, naturally. Um, and so by practicing regenerative agriculture, you're able to address a lot of these water quality concerns. And we're really promoting that to the county as a best management practice um, that producers should be acknowledged for, for doing. Um, so this is where we're, we're kind of putting it all into practice. There's a great producer that we're working with in Escondido um, who has an avocado orchard um, that, uh, that they're using as kind of an experimental grounds to see what they can do to reduce water use um, and improve soil health. Um, and the, the orchard was originally um, maybe like a 60 foot high conventional orchard, um, extremely productive conventional grove, but um, in the context of drought and wildfire with rising water rates um, and, and uh, wildfire near the property, those 60 foot high trees became a huge liability. So the new producer, the one that we work with, took it over and said, okay, I can't afford those, those water bills uh, to support a farm like this, especially with those threats. What can I do? And they decided that diversifying the grove um, 
as well as planting it more densely and keeping the height of the trees lower would allow them to be a little bit more flexible. In addition to which, um, they reached out to us and to the Department of Food and Agriculture uh, to look for other methods uh, for retaining water on site. And so the ones that, that we're, we're trying are composting, mulching, and planting cover crops. And of course, many producers in San Diego are doing all of these, um, but here we have control sites um, and treatment sites so that we can see what the effects are relatively. Um, and, uh, and we're also trying to support them through different methods. So, so far, um, it's become clear that the cover crops really do need irrigation. Um, and so there's a, a lot more effort, even in the, in, in the winter season, to irrigate those crops. But um, the compost is just a very obvious um, tactic to use, and so is the mulch in these orchards. The greatest barrier that they and other producers in the area have found is there isn't good equipment to do it with. And so we're doing our best right now to look for ways to fund a uh, blower to improve that um, and put that skin on the soil, make sure that there's less runoff, um, that there's more water retention, uh, and that there's more nutrients being held at the soil. And so um, through this process, we're monitoring the soil organic carbon, soil moisture, the biomass of the crops created, and the cost as well. And we're doing the moisture through an instantaneous meter as well through tens as through tensiometers in these different plots. Um, so just going back to some of the services that we provide that relate to water quality, um, we do irrigation education for gardeners. We have a grant from, um, well, as I mentioned, we have our two community gardens, the Tijuana River Valley Community Garden, which has about 200 um, gardeners, and the Sweetwater Community Garden in Benita, which has about 150. And through a grant from the National Association of Conservation Districts and um, NRCS uh, funding, uh, we've been able to provide public classes at our educational center, Wild Willow Farm. Um, and so some of those classes have focused on irrigation efficiency, which is very important. Um, uh, the teacher there has explained that most people aren't really aware of how much water an individual plant needs. I'm sure that's different for commercial producers like yourselves, um, but um, knowing the needs of an individual plant and and creating uh, uniformity in the irrigation system can really help to not only save water, but improve the productivity. Um, and so along with that, we've provided one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to those gardeners. And, um, and a related program to this that we do at the elementary level is uh, through the Port of San Diego, we provide water quality education to elementary school students. Um, but coming more to the services for commercial producers. Uh, you can see here, my colleague Greg and I are um, conducting an irrigation evaluation up in Palma Valley. Um, and so we provide through funding from the California Department of Food and Agriculture, irrigation evaluations and pump efficiency tests. Um, our irrigation technician just started this month. So we've been doing this as a side service, but now it's officially something that we are fully providing um, reg on a regular basis. And so the main thing that we do is a distribution uniformity test. And I know a lot of you have learned from Jerry Spinelli in the past and that his, his videos are on this website. And so I won't go into depth about the calculations themselves, but essentially what a distribution uniformity test does is identifies the least efficient um, emitters or the, the least efficient sprinklers in a certain row of plants. Um, and, and through that, we create recommendations about how you can get that um, efficiency or how much water each emitter is, is releasing similar to those others. So that might in involve installing pressure regulators. Um, it might involve flushing your system. Uh, you might um, actually consider rearranging where the pump is so that uh, there's, uh, or even uh, splitting or distributing the lines to deal with contours. Because ideally you want the pressure and the distance uh, of each row to be pretty uniform so that uh, otherwise you're overwatering some plants and under underwatering others. Um, and as, as interesting as that is, um, a lot of you may have some knowledge of that already just by walking around your operations, but where this becomes important is um, an irrigation efficiency test makes you eligible for rebates 
from the County of San Diego and from the County Water Authority. And so we are not by no means the only ones that provide this service. Um, Cooperative Extension provides uh, irrigation efficiency tests to nursery producers. Um, and Mission Resource Conservation District um, has had this program active for the last 10 years. They're, they've done an amazing service to the county, uh, but their just jurisdiction is located mostly in the northwest of the county. Um, under our grant, we're able to provide for producers located within our jurisdiction, as well as that of Upper San Luis Rey. So if you're interested in an irrigation evaluation, you haven't received one yet, feel free to reach out. Um, if you happen to be located in missions jurisdiction, we'll just connect you with them um, because they, they do great work. Um, also, as part of this grant from the Department of Food and Agriculture, um, we received funding to provide, uh, to connect people to pump efficiency tests. So this is, the purpose of this is to make you eligible for another grant. That is the SWEET grant, uh, the State Water Efficiency and Water and Energy Efficiency Program. Um, and that makes up to a couple hundred thousand dollars available for all sorts of improvements like uh, solar panels, new pumps, uh, uh, variable frequency drives, thrip line, et cetera. Um, but to be eligible for that, you need to have a pump efficiency test done to make sure that you know how much energy your pump is using to pump a certain volume. And there are very few contractors available locally to provide that. So we're happy to connect you to a contractor. And excuse me, um, if you uh, have a smaller operation, less than 50 acres, or um, if you are an underserved population, historically underserved population, then we can provide a rebate of up to $500 for that test. Um, so um, we're glad to be able to now offer those services. Um, another thing that we, we do to address water quality concerns is focus through soil health. Um, and this is largely from funding from the Department of Food and Agriculture at the state level and NRCS at the federal level um, through healthy soils programs. And so we provide guidance on how to implement conservation practices. You can see in this picture, the producer has applied mulch to an avocado orchard, which has severely reduced um, the, the weeds, suppressed the weeds, as well as improved organic matter, retained soil moisture. Um, it is well worth the effort, especially for a young orchard um, when it's not producing the leaf litter yet to protect itself. Um, and so, but it, it can be difficult to work with the Department of Food and Agriculture. They're a large um, bureaucracy, essentially. Um, they do really important programs, but court communication can be difficult. So we're glad to play middleman and make sure that your voice is heard to them as part of those grants. Um, we also work with a private group um, called Zero Foodprint that subsidizes compost. So if you'd like to apply compost, to your property and it's looking costly, let's say to transport it, that's usually the major cost, Zero Foodprint um, will, will subsidize that cost through um, their Restore California and Compost Connector programs. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, um, we now have access to all this funding and all this material of compost and mulch, um, but uh, it's hard to get it out on the field. And so what you're looking at here, this was done with a Kubota and a wheelbarrow and a five gallon bucket. And a lot of producers are doing it that way, especially on these steep slopes, you can't really use um, a compost spreader. So what we're looking for right now is partners to help us acquire a blower that producers would be able to use to blow compost, um, even cover crop seed, uh, but compost and mulch onto these steeper slopes in narrow alleys and, and make sure that they're getting the benefits of healthy soils that's going to retain that water, uh, reduce runoff, reduce uh, nutrient infiltration, et cetera. Um, so I mentioned a lot of different funding opportunities. This is a summary of some of those opportunities. Um, as I mentioned, the SWEET program from the Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, in order to apply, you need a pump efficiency test. Uh, the Department of Food and Agriculture Healthy Soils program, it does not fund irrigation infrastructure, but there are water quality benefits to the healthy soils practices that they fund. Um, the EQIP grants from the Natural Resource Conservation Service and Environmental Quality Improvement Program, EQIP, um, fantastic program. They offer a really wide range of support, um, but the rates are not as high. 
and the process is slow. So that's a long-term commitment if you'd like to apply it for EQIP and we can connect you to the local providers for that. Um, and then the, both the County of San Diego and County Water Authority provide rebates of up to $5,500 per property or $500 per acre for a lot of these um, irrigation system improvements that have water quality benefits. Um, they require an irrigation evaluation, as I described earlier, and the jurisdictions are kind of weird. Um, for the water authority rebates, you need to be in a water district. So if you're in the far east side of the county or even the south side of the county, you may not be eligible for that. Um, the county of San Diego rebates apply for anyone in the unincorporated area. Um, so that should apply to most of the producers here. But that also means that some of you will be eligible for both. If, for example, let's say you're in uh, uh, Valley Center and you're covered by a water district, but you're also in the unincorporated county, you may be eligible for two sets of rebates. So those are the direct services that we provide. Um, and as I mentioned, other RCDs in the area do, do similar um, support. Um, but I'm going to zoom out for a moment because we've been really focused for the last year on something larger scale, which has some water quality and, and water supply implications, which is a planning program that's in partnership with the um, Local Agency Formation Commission, LAFCO, and Mission RCD, among other regional partners. Um, and this is through a grant from the State Department of Conservation for um, Agricultural Conservation. Um, and we've taken this as an opportunity to try to bring together the varying voices that represent agriculture, much as the Farm Bureau does, but trying to add a few more people to the table um, to make sure that some of these important issues get addressed and as best we can. Um, and the first, one of the first steps in that policy process after doing outreach and mapping out those areas has been conducted by San Diego State University City Planning Department, who has identified um, a lot of the policy barriers, not just in the unincorporated county, but in municipalities that affect agriculture. Um, and so our goal is to identify policies um, that are acting as barriers to agriculture and then engage public representatives, agricultural producers and organizations to address those issues. Um, and with our final report and the working groups that we've, we're working on over the next year, we hope to advocate this to uh, producers, uh, sorry, to, to county representatives and, and other agencies um, in a way that it could really gain some traction because we're going to show um, how many people are engaged in this. And so uh, we've just had three meetings over the last month about different topics. One of those was specifically about water efficiency. Um, but our next step is a strategic planning meeting on September 6th in San Marcos. You're welcome to attend. And um, the focus of the meeting is to develop these working groups on three core programs to demonstrate the progress that we're making to address these issues. Um, so one of those programs that we're going to be um, pushing is crop swap. It's something that's already active in Riverside County. Uh, Mission RCD operates this because they they work both in San Diego counties and for partner RCDs up, up north. And what it does is it funds growers to reduce their water use by changing which crops they're using or just changing to a different variety or rootstock that's more water efficient. Um, and this is really important to me. I hear too many producers saying, you know, we just left the avocado industry altogether. We left agriculture altogether. Perhaps we converted over to, to nursery production on a smaller scale and we had to sell our grow for firewood. And if we had local support, we wouldn't have to make those sacrifices. Uh, we, we, we need support to make those transitions. And so what Riverside County has largely done is switched over to wine grapes, maybe to olives, um, but also to higher density plantings of avocados or salt tolerant root crop, uh, rootstocks. Um, and there are potential local funding sources as well as federal funding sources for a pilot project. Um, so the working group will be um, designing this program to make a proposal for funding. Um, this is not a project that we're, we're working on, but we are advocating for this as part of, um, as part of the planning program. 
um, because we really recognize the great work that the city of Escondido and the Escondido Growers for Agricultural Preservation have done um, to look at uh, storm, or sorry, wastewater as a resource that, that could really be used to support agriculture. Um, and so city of Escondido with EGAP's guidance is really leading the way um, for directing uh, recycled water, reverse osmosis treated water to agricultural use. Um, and so this is becoming the next major source of water in our region. Uh, however, largely it's being used for urban use. If you look at the city of San Diego's program, for example, um, it's gonna have huge impacts on water demand in the region, but it's mostly gonna be going back into residential and commercial. Um, what Escondido is doing so well is they're directing some of that water to agricultural producers. And all the, the city of Escondido has really asked is that they wanna know how much people need because they're producing so much wastewater and they're paying to ship that wastewater outside of their boundaries that um, it makes sense to them to process that water and make it available. But we don't have a demand analysis or a cost analysis for what that would look like. And if we had that for the city of Escondido, then it could be used as a model for other water districts that are also implementing use. Um, and then lastly, and I think this has probably the most direct relationship to water quality issues, um, is groundwater. Um, groundwater is not a major source of water generally in San Diego as a whole, but in agriculture, agriculture, as you know, um, it's extremely important to individual producers. It allows you all to weather through drought conditions well um, or deal with, uh, with lower rates than a water district might require. Um, even with some of those quality issues. A lot of people have high chlorides or salinity, um, but those, those water quality issues get worse the, the more that we pump. And so you'll see on this, um, on this map, the three uh, basins that have been identified by the state, San Pasqual Valley, Upper San Luis Array, and Borrego Springs as being vulnerable or priority basins under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So we're not focused on Borrego Springs and, and we're not located in Upper San Luis Rey, but our partner, our CDs are. Um, but we're really interested in the San Pasqual Valley Basin and upstream of that, um, the city of Ramona, and, and which is uh, most producers there have pretty good well water access. But um, as as we pump those, those aquifers, uh, more than the natural recharge, whatever contamination is in the water um, gets worse and worse. And so conversely, if we're able to add fresh water back into those groundwater basins, it improves our water quality conditions by diluting it. Um, as they say, dilution is the solution. So um, not only does it improve water quality, but improves drought resilience. And why I think this, this a project like this would have traction is that um, there's really a lot of habitat benefits from uh, improving the groundwater as well, where there's riparian and wetland restoration opportunities proximate to these areas. So where a lot of the times agricultural producers are seen as uh, being adversarial to maybe ecologists or habitat people who want to choose sides, this isn't one of those situations. This could be something that's mutually beneficial and there is funding available to build um, groundwater recharge basins through state funding. Um, and so we wanna be on the lookout for a project where we could do something like that. Um, so I know that was a lot of information, a, a bit scattered at times, but it's easy to stay uh, in touch and follow along. Every month we send out a newsletter, um, which talks about the current uh, grant deadlines that are coming up, any events, uh, that are coming up, the services that we provide, and a nice article that's been crafted. Um, and so follow this link, rcdsandiego.org slash carbon farming, and you'll be able to sign up for our newsletter, rcdsandiego.org slash carbon farming. And if you just have any general questions, if you want an irrigation evaluation, or uh, would like to talk more about some of these larger policy proposals, feel free to reach out. Um, you can contact any of our staff um, at, at, on the ag team at ag at rcdsandiego.org or call us at 619-562-0096.
been great talking with you. I'm open to any questions you may have. Um, if, if you don't have questions, then I, I definitely have a question for you. I'd love to know who's here today. Um, if you'd like to use the chat, it'd be nice to hear um, what part of the county you're from and, and what you grow. I'll drop one and two for our, uh, our farm down in the South Bay. Don't be shy, guys. Let's use this opportunity to ask those questions. Thanks, Mike. And Mike, have you worked with Mission RCD to get a irrigation evaluation? I see that you're in Fallbrook. Thanks, Greg. So we've got some nursery growers. We have some avocado growers. Do you have any citrus growers with us today or row crops? We've got foliage and bromeliads. That's beautiful. Don't really know what an anthurium is. That's interesting. Great. Yeah, it looks like most people here are in missions jurisdiction and um, Rainbow, Fallbrook. So I would hope that you've you've had those services provided by Mission Valley Center. Great. Um, and the nursery production, I think, Greg, that was you. Um, I hope that you've been in touch with uh, Jerry Spinelli over at Cooperative Extension. It can really help with that. I have. The problem with some of the, the programs is that they require a pump, and we're using city water, so there's no pump involved in, yeah. in trying to get some of the, you know, some of the sweet grants. That's really frustrating. We've we've uh, complained to CDFA that it's really exclusive in that way, but they haven't changed the program. So let me ask a question. So what if I put an additional pump onto my city water line to increase my pressure and volume? Is, would that get me, um, would that satisfy the requirement? Possibly. I mean, I've even brought up to them whether a booster pump would, would qualify I'm not entirely sure, but I think possibly because so many of the practices that they fund don't really relate to pumps. They just want to see a greenhouse gas benefit. So it's worth exploring. Thank you. I hope there aren't any other questions. I want to give a warm thank you to Joel for his time. And um, it looks like we're at an hour, so this will satisfy one hour of your annual education requirement. If you do have additional questions, please feel free to contact us here at the Irrigated Lands Group office, or you're welcome to contact Joel directly. Thank you so much, Joel. We really appreciate your time and expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.